Gotti, and on behalf of the Park Rapids Area League of Women Voters, I would like to welcome you this evening. Um, you know, tonight we are initiating a really important discussion. I don't know of a parent who hasn't had a child, a working parent, who hasn't had a child care dilemma at some time in their child's life. Um, my daughter's 52 years old, and I still remember, I still feel the pit in my stomach that I had when I was looking for quality child care, for consistent child care. And then, what happens if her provider had to take a well-earned day off, or took vacation, or what would happen if my daughter was sick and she couldn't go to childcare? But I was still a working mom. I had to go to work. The childcare challenges are as old as working parents. I should say working moms, because in most cases, moms are the ones that have the burden on their shoulders. So I'm delighted this evening the Park Rapids Area League of Women Voters is initiating a discussion. We hope to be a catalyst to try to get some issues addressed and at least bring them to everybody's awareness because child care is really everybody's business, not just parents, but certainly employers are business people in this community. Everyone should be concerned about child care. So, to help us create that awareness, um, I'm just delighted that we have a panel of local experts. And um, they are going to present some information about the challenges and the rewards that they see. So, first of all, Lisa Branston. Lisa, it's yes. just really nice to have you. Lisa is um, the licensor for Hubbard County. She's been with Hubbard County for six and a half years. She's primarily responsible for accepting applications, reviewing, licensing, family child care. Carrie Smith is with us. Carrie is a longtime provider in Hubbard County. She first got her license in 2001 in Hubbard County. But Carrie started her child care career in 1989 as a nanny in California. Um, her and her military husband lived all over the country, and Carrie was involved in uh, preschools, and then finally they landed back in Park Rapids, and Carrie started providing care in Hubbard County. Um, Haley Sharp. Haley is a brand new child care provider in Hubbard County. So Carrie's at the very experienced end, and Haley is brand new, saying, what is all this about? <laughs> Zoe Matson. Zoe is a parent who has struggled with finding infant child care. And all of us know, if you've had an infant and you've been looking for child care, all of us know what a challenge that is. And it's not only a challenge in Hubbard County, it's a challenge throughout this state and throughout this country. And then Jennifer Toll. Jennifer has been in um, kind of the child care, child protection, licensing child and adult care foster homes for six and a half years. She previously worked in Cass County and now she works in Hubbard County. She's also the secondary child care uh, licensor in Hubbard County. So we would like to welcome all of you. They each have kind of a, a different list of questions and issues that they're going to discuss. So Lisa, we're going to start with you. Okay, thank you. Yep. As Leah said, I'm Lisa Branstrom, the primary family child care licensor for Hubbard County. Um, it'll be almost six years that I've been in this position, so enough time to see all different sorts of child care. Um, a lot of great ones go, and a lot of great ones come. So. Um, the first question they asked is, what's the definition of child care? Um, and there's a different definition for everyone. But what I came up with is 
A family child care program is a form of early childhood education in which a caregiver looks after children in their own home or a commercial space. Um, a family child care is typically licensed for between 10 to 14 children. Although these numbers do vary by the types of license that they apply for and if they're accepted. Um, the various types of child care available in our area would be first and foremost family child care because it's my favorite. Um, there is a couple different child care centers in Park Rapids. There's none offered in Laporte or Nevis or any of those, um, but a couple here. There's um, some school exempt child cares, legal non licensed care, and always what we need the most is our family network that we rely on. Um, the current status of child care in Hubbard County is right now is 42 with Miss Haley Sharp being our most newly licensed provider and then there's three more in application right now. So um, not the highest it's ever been um, but probably getting towards the lowest it's ever been. Um, some options for parents is what I answered before you know you can go to a family child care, a center, uh, relying on grandparents and aunts, uncles, friends, and those legal non-licensed providers. Uh, Leah had asked me if large employers such as REO, St. Joseph Hospitals, Park Rapids Area Schools, Social Services, any Hubbard County position offers child care on site, and they do not. There is not one that I have. We discussed with St. Joseph's Health before on licensing one of their spaces, um, but it, it hasn't really went anywhere and that was a while ago. So they do have a different, couple different homes that they could license, but it's always finding that provider that's gonna take on that responsibility and work those hours and provide the care. Um, I'm not aware of any financial assistance that any provider or any employer would pay extra to a mother or a father that has to pay for childcare. It's built into what your pay is. Um, this is a big one, especially with the different jobs we have in town is, are there options provided for shift workers, infants and toddlers, as well as school-aged children, or children recovering from illness or sick children? Um, there's just a couple providers in our area that will provide care outside the regular 7.30 to 5, 7 to 5.30, those kind of hours. Just, there's just a couple that will work with those shift workers. Um, from there, it becomes a lot. When do they sleep? If they're providing care during the day and then they take a shift worker and you still have to have supervision just because a child is sleeping doesn't mean the child doesn't need supervision so that becomes tough and it's very limited in our area um, as far as this makes me giggle care for sick children it would be in nobody's best interest to put a bunch of sick children in the same space together and share all their germs with their weakened immune systems and all of that. So no, unfortunately it falls back on the parent that they need to be home and well and fever free and all of that before they can return to a licensed care facility. Um, what is the quality of child care programs in our community? Uh, this is a great subject to touch on. Um, it hasn't been mentioned throughout all this preparing for tonight's forum, um, but we need to acknowledge the exceptional care that we have in Hubbard County with our providers. They are very diligent on what they do every day and how they care for those children. They, I mean, I oversee 42 child care licenses. I'm in their home. Um, I watch each and every one of them have a passion for children that they care for, as well as being compliant to the hundreds of licensing rules that they're supposed to upkeep. Um, something that I feel is needed to improve child care services in Hubbard County. I'm not looking to improve the services we already have. We have great services. We have great providers. Um, I'm in their homes, like I said. I'm watching them provide care. They have routines with children. I watch their meal preps, their problem solving, the different activities they plan for the kids day in and day out, and it's never the same one, I promise you that. Um, <laughs> But I also watch that the love they give to those children and Carrie's my personal provider, so it touches me. It really does. <laughs> so I appreciate them all, and not just Carrie, but every single one of them that I oversee loves the children in their care, and they care for them very well. Um, but something we could do to help the providers we do have is more funding so they don't put so much money back into their own child care, because most of them do. I know when my mouse goes bad at Hubbard County Social Services, I tell the front desk to order me a new one. 
their mouse goes bad, they have to get on Amazon or somewhere else and order one for themselves. A toy breaks, nobody replaces that, they replace that out of their pocket. So I'd love to see some more funding for them um, to put back into their childcare space. Um, Jennifer Toll actually helped me with this idea, is helping find some substitutes so these providers can go to a doctor's appointments and they don't have to close for a whole day. Or they can go to their kids' sporting events in the afternoons or evenings without having to think of 10 different families that are going to have to leave work to come pick up their children early so they can go be a parent to their own families. Um, it'd be tough. You have to be background studied and have certain trainings and potential putting a stranger with 10 kids that ne ne have never seen you before. Um, but really, these providers work at least 10 hours a day with zero, to, zero breaks whatsoever. Um, and they deserve a break too without having to think about the impact it's making on the 10 people or the 10 families enrolled in their care. Um, something else I hope to gain from this forum uh, is more individuals thinking about making a career change and feel that this is it. Somebody's talking to them right now. This is my time to change. Because um, I would like good quality applicants that have, have a passion for caring for children that want to do this, not just because there's a need in our county, but because they care about children and they want to help shape their little minds. Thank you. Um, hi, so I'm Carrie Smith. I think I know some of you out there. Um, I um, have been a child care provider for a long time. Um, I did start with a, being a nanny in California right after high school. I was barely 18 and I took off and signed with a nanny agency and went and uh, explored the world. So I was going to the United States, so it was great. Um, we were given some pretty specific questions, and of course I have a soapbox I can get on, but I'm going to try to keep it brief, and I also need to put my glasses on to read it. <laughs> um, so one of the questions um, we were asked was, what do child care providers expect from parents in terms of timeliness? Um, and so what I'll say to that is, um, <clears throat> obviously, um, we have business hours, um, because we have to. I usually enroll families based on my current family's working hours and commute time or school hours. Um, and so if I have a contract with a family and everybody's scheduled to be gone by 4.45, that's my, that's my time limit. I expect them to be on time. Um, I live right in town, Park Rapids. The daycare house is right in town. It's pretty easy for everybody to get to me in, a, in on time. It's you know Usually if there's snow, it's not that big of a deal because I, I leave enough time for that. Um, some of the issues that can happen with that is, as an example, because there's such a shortage for childcare this year, I filled in spots that I wouldn't normally fill in with part-time families. I almost never do this, um, but because there are so many people that needed childcare, I have some kids that go to preschool two days a week, and so I have several part-time kids that come two days a week from eight to three when my preschoolers are gone. Um, the issue with that is if that 3 o'clock family is late picking up and my bus comes at 3.15, I will be over capacity when those kids come off that bus. Um, so it, it can be a tricky, it's a balance. You have to find a balance. And so um, the family is thankful that I enrolled for those part-time spots, really understood that they, it needed to be by 3 o'clock so that they could have their snack and be ready to go before the bus came with my other kiddos. Um, that's probably it for timeliness. Um, you know, drop off time you open when you open. So I don't really have a lot of, I, I don't really have a lot of issues with people being late. Um, every once in a while, sure, somebody gets hung up at work or whatever, and um, they'll shoot me a quick text and say, I'm doing the best I can, I'll get there. And sometimes I'll, I'll say, I have plans tonight, you know, you need, might need to find somebody else. And other times I'll be like, that's okay, you know, I'm good for an extra five minutes, it's no big deal. Um, the second question, was the big one that was asked about what are our expectations for healthy children. <laughs> and I'll piggyback off what Lisa said, you know, if somebody brings me a child who's ill and, and I'm, I have to care for them, or I, I actually don't, but I would, you know, if they showed up and I didn't know they were ill, sometimes they give them Tylenol and then they spike 102 temp at noon. Um, they have just infected all of the other children with an illness, and not every, but not all their immune systems can handle illnesses. I have some kids that are immune compromised. 
Um, and so the more we can keep them away from illnesses, the better. Um, I'm pretty good about telling my families, if something comes up, let's talk about it and then we'll decide. I kind of handle illnesses mostly on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I don't exclude for, um, I actually just had a mom text me this morning and she said, hey, he woke up this morning complaining about his ear, we're going to take him to the doctor. And I said, okay, if, they, if it's just an ear infection and he gets his meds and he's good to go, he can come back to daycare today. He can come to daycare today. I'm not about excluding kids that, you know, an ear infection isn't contagious. Um, he went to the doctor, he had a double ear infection, they gave him his meds, That he was fine all day today. Um, <clears throat> So I'm not about just excluding to exclude. I really try to use our best judgment to make sure everybody's healthy. Um, and then if you're bringing them to me sick and then I get sick, guess what I have to do? <laughs> I have to close and then nobody has childcare. So um, it's, it, that, that would probably be the biggest issue. One of the things that I stress the most at my orientation visits is um, we need to communicate about illnesses, whether it's in your family, at your house, you, you know, they were at the neighbors and they had COVID and, you know, I don't exclude because they were maybe in contact with somebody, but it just gives us a heads up so that we know to watch for stuff. Um, that's about it for that. Payments, what does it include? Um, this one I could go on and on about what it includes as far as you know, a safe environment for their children and, um, you know, all that. All, I, I'm, I'm pretty good about replacing equipment and moving things around and I'm kind of always buying new stuff and um, maybe I shouldn't be doing that, but I, I, do, I do it a lot. <laughs> um, you know, but it pays for the facility and the heat and electricity and the food and the construction paper and crayons and it also pays for their spot. Um, because we are limited by how many children we can enroll, we can't just oh say, oh, I need a new car. Um, I'm going to take on two more kids so that I can afford a car payment. We can't do that. We are licensed by how many children we have. So we don't have the flexibility to just take on another child or two to make some more money. We can't do that. You know how we make more money? We have to raise our rates. And guess what that does? That just goes back to the parents and who are sometimes already struggling. Um, and so... Um, it includes a lot. I mean, we, we have to pay for our trainings, which are, are many. You know, um, it's gotten, it used to be a few. It's increased greatly. Um, so, and, and just all of the things that come with childcare. I don't, that's, um, that's kind of all I have as far as payment goes. Um, there, there are some, um, there are some programs to help with um, childcare, but you have to be very low income to qualify. Um, so it doesn't really help those middle class families that are just kind of struggling, you know, maybe pay, living paycheck, paycheck to paycheck, could maybe benefit from a little help, um, don't necessarily need it, but it would, it would help them along. They don't qualify for any of the programs that are out there. So that would be something that would be nice to see, something for more of those, those middle, middle, middle class families. Um, the next thing was signed contract. Um, yes, we have contracts. Um, for me, I do two visits with families when they um, interview. I do one after hours um, where we come and we visit and we, I, they tour the space. They can ask questions. Um, a lot of times that will lead to going over all of the policies um, or most of them that I have written. Um, sometimes it doesn't. Um, sometimes they'll, they'll be interested. I'll send them with the policy and they can go over it and then we can text questions. I actually just enrolled... I have two openings. I had two openings for September. I don't anymore. I, they have since filled. Um, but I just didn't. I just had a conversation with a family for September of 2024, um, and they are just going to use family until until I have an opening. In case maybe somebody will move. That's actually happened twice. But I, I mean, it's 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 tough out there. So I do have signed contracts and then hold forms. Um, and then the next question they asked us was. Um, vacation pay and sick pay. This is where it gets sticky with some families because um, I base my rate off what I need to make annually. And then I divide that by 52 and that's my weekly rate. Um, some people do a daily rate, some do an hourly rate, some give discounts, some don't. 
I actually have one week of unpaid time in the summer, um, always 4th of July week. It's never, it's, it's always the same. Everybody knows exactly when it is. It's an unpaid time for me. And then I have one paid week in the winter, always one week in the winter. Um, I have sick pay unless, and I have, there's, there's some circumstances there, but for the most part, it's paid time. Um, and I use this analogy with families. When you are enrolling your children in childcare, you are paying for your spot. Your spot is your spot for 10 hours a day, five days a week, guaranteed, unless something crazy happens. It's your spot. You're not just paying for care, you're paying for the spot. Again, because we're limited, we can't, we can't just say, oh, so-and-so didn't show up on Tuesday, let me call and fill it with this. You know, that doesn't always work. Um, and so I use the analogy of, do you pay your mortgage even though you're not in your house? <laughs> right? It, that's the analogy I use. You don't call your mortgage company and say, hey, I didn't use my house last week. I was on vacation. Do I get a week's break on my mortgage? And I, I try to get them, when they interview with me or visit with me, I give them that analogy to kind of help it make sense. Because otherwise, it, I mean, I understand it seems difficult to have to pay for childcare when your child's not there but you pay your mortgage when you're not in your house. You know, and I get that you get your house at the end, but you get your children at the end too. So, um, and I think that was it for my questions. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Okay. All right, so yes, like as Lisa said, I'm Haley Sharp. Um, I actually previously worked with Mojave Atwa with Head Start, so I remember you know, Dana a little bit when you were in the office. Um, and I was a site coordinator and I worked with the family child cares that contracted with um, Head Start. So I've never been a family child care myself, but I've worked with family child care and I learned a lot from them. So then I got pregnant and in the middle of maternity leave I quit my job and I told myself I'd reassess what I wanted to do after he was a year. So I'm sitting there and then our friend, Zoe here, <laughs> um, expressing how hard it was to find good daycare. And so I woke up the next morning like, okay, what am I doing? I got some education, you know, experience of, you know, seeing how daycare sponsors some great ideas. And I'm like, I have a friend here that's just in, just in tears. And I'm here, I'm at home with my son. And, and of course my daughter like comes off the bus. So I'm like, okay, I can just well watch Whaley and I'll see, maybe I'll be interested in the daycare. And so yes, that started in September. I've been watching Little Whitley. And um, so yes, just got licensed this last week. And um, just seeing the need, I've always loved children. I've, I've worked in and out of youth programs since college. Um, and then I got a social work degree too, so I just kind of have that passion. Um, and yeah, so I didn't come as prepared. Um, <laughs> but coming at it new, so I just finished my policy book literally like a week ago. So I mean, Carrie went spot on. I mean, she's a veteran. She knows. Um, I think the only thing different, what I found hard about the policy book was, yeah, what do I do for sick days? Um, do I have the parents pay me some of my personal days, like a regular job? But I'm like, as a parent, I know how hard it was when my daycare closed just two years ago. And I was like, oh my God, I can't miss work. Like, uh. um, but, you know, I realized too, though, as a provider, you need some time too. So what the difference, I think, from Carrie, I have um, a few paid holidays. Um, pretty much the federal ones that some people would have in some jobs. Um, and then um, I'm not charging families if I'm gone at all, if I'm on vacation, sick, anything. Um, but same thing, they will pay whether their kid is there or not. And again, she, I love the analogy of that, that makes sense. Um, because yeah, they're holding their spot. Um, so that makes sense. Um, so that's probably kind of the difference with that. Um, the process of getting license, I guess I can call since it was so new. Lee's has been fabulous, very organized. Um, I would say the one thing with me coming from working with providers, I kind of knew the ins and outs and working with my hubby, you know, I was reached out. There's some new positions, um, a child care navigator, Sarah Poller, I don't know if she was her last name now, but um, kind of helps, can help you navigate the licensing and, and mediating different things and resources, a lot of grants, so that is a positive right now that I could think motivate providers to 
want to do daycare because like any business it takes a lot of money to start up a business and if you want to provide a quality environment I mean if you're starting up I mean you probably don't have a lot of savings depending on your situation and so a lot of the grants startup grants have been very helpful to me um, so that's child care aware um, with Mahadi Atwa and then the Moorhead Community Action as well um, so that's a positive that I've utilized and looking into some other grants right now too so I can provide a lot of new um, toys and materials and um, a new environment. Um, what else? But I could see, so come somebody come totally new, it could seem a little more overwhelming, the paperwork, there is a lot. I think even Lisa said there might be more paperwork to get child care license than there is to foster care licensing. But again, I think that should be kind of a strenuous process because we want good, good you know, you know, people applying for this. They're taking care of like up to, what, 14 kids depending on your license. So you want somebody, you want it to be background checks, um, knowing their history, all that stuff. So I think that's all needed. Um, one <coughs> challenge I have found as a mom and now will be a provider, I only have the one kiddo right now. I want to get my environment a little more up to, up to par before I um, I live in a five level house. I want to be fully downstairs, so I'm not bebopping kids up and down. So I'm trying to get a kitchenette down there. Um, so before I take more kids, I do want to get that done so I can give that good care that I want to give. Um, but I'm going to switch a thought here. What was I going to say? Um, I'm forgetting, I start rambling. <laughs> oh, I lost it. Um, where was I going? Do you think I was talking about grants? What? I'm talking about grants. Oh, I forget. Licensing paperwork. <laughs> Just it being intimidating. Oh, uh, as a parent too, the one challenge I have found, so I have a one and a half year old and I have a six year old, first grader. So one thing I have found, like talking about the hours, like that, is, that was another challenge I figured out because it's like my husband works in the road. So my kids are in activity, just for kicks, Caitlin. Um, so I'm like, hey, I want her to do these things and I want to be the one to pick her up and stuff. But luckily I do have grandparents to help support. I think as a child provider, if you're kind of doing it on your own, you need that support system too. So I think that could be a challenge for some moms that want to be providers or dads. Um, and so figuring out how you can meet the needs of the family, but also your family, like you said. So that's been kind of a tricky thing that I'm going to have to keep navigating to, because I want to be able to do both, right? We want to be a good mom and we want to be a good worker. So, um, yeah, kind of questions. I think that's about all I got. Okay, thank you. So my name is Zoe Matson. Um, and like Haley said, my daughter, um, she is just turned 16 months. So I found out I was pregnant with her, um, actually like this time, 2021. Um, everyone kind of says when you, you know, find out you're pregnant, you tell your significant other, and then you start calling daycare. <laughs> and you don't really have, um, you know, any downtime to start figuring that out. So you reach out to Lisa and she gives you the list and you kind of have to start going through, okay, yes, these providers are in Hubbard County, but they live in La Porte or they're close to Bemidji, okay? I'm not driving to La Porte for daycare. So you, you know, you kind of start going through, you know, crossing off people that aren't even in, um, in the area. Um, so you kind of just have to start calling people and um, some people, you know, answer and sorry, you know, we don't have any, any infant spots for two years or a year, you know, we'll get you on a wait list. Some people don't have wait lists. So I think I had gone through about 12 providers before I got in touch with, um, the first provider that my daughter started going to. Um, and she had a daycare, um, in a separate home than what she lived in and Whitley started there in May of last year. Um, sorry, March, March of last year. She was done in May because that provider decided to um, close her daycare. So we had daycare, solid daycare for about three months um, and then we had to figure out something else. So um, at that time, from May to September, we didn't have solid daycare. So um, parents, grandparents, aunts, Friends, we had um, anyone that could could help us. Brought my husband and I um, took off a lot of time just just to watch our daughter. So we struggled, and we um, 
working with Aunt Haley. So she's been helping us, which has been great. And now um, she's in her in her care full time now. So it's it's a struggle. You you find out you're pregnant, and you have to start figuring out daycare. And the the one of the struggles is knowing that we need good quality care for our children because you're not going to just let anyone take care of your child or children multiple, you know, and it's really difficult to um, call these people that you don't even know and you're just going to trust them with everything that you have that they're going to take care of your children and they're going to do a good job. Um, so that is kind of scary starting out that you just don't know what, um, what that's going to look like. So, um, you know, we've, our first provider was great um, and she had um, a um, assistant um, and her, um, you know, her mother-in-law would come once a week and do activities with the kids. So she had help, which was great. Um, but that, again, too, you don't, you know, assistance, you know, you would love, you would love more people to be able to just to come in um, and help these providers, too. But that's just, you know, another risk that you take, just having other people within the home or within the daycare itself. Um, but, yeah, we're... Um, we're struggling in, I mean, all communities, I feel like, all over the place with just having good quality care um, and being in a good place to have your kids because you just don't want them with anyone. So, yeah. <laughs> all right, and I'm Jen Toll. I, yeah, I'm secondary licensor for child foster care, child family care, sorry, family child care. Thank you. <laughs> Primarily um, child foster care though. And uh, I think my question was how do foster parents plan for child care? And that's a huge question because I don't really have an answer. Typically when people are applying, I explain similar to what everyone has said here, you can pay to hold a spot financially, that's not usually feasible. Um, and then second option would be when you get a placement, if that child is already in care, so far we've been super lucky where we've been able to keep kids uh, when they go into out-of-home placement with their same child care provider so they have some sense of consistency in their life. Um, but if that's not an option, I have to tell my applicants, lean on your support systems. Who do you have in your life that can help out? Grandmas, grandpas, aunts, friends. Um, so as far as the foster care world, it does make things more difficult if we have placement needs. Um, above and beyond that though, even in my own personal life, again, same struggles that everyone had. Um, I have three kids and we had <laughs> grandmas and grandpas helping out long periods of time where I really had to lean on my father-in-law to care for the babies. So I'm so grateful for that. But again, it just, wow. Um, and I do have a provider who has been so wonderful for all three of my kids. But again, the capacity limitations, having to wait and you know being respectful of that. Um, yeah. I think so. Ladies, thank you. My goodness. <laughs> it's just overwhelming to see the dedication <laughs> and the care that you provide to our little ones. We have, the on. we have time <laughs> for our questions. So, would anyone like to ask a question or a clarification or talk about issues that they experience? Someone mentioned a list, and I'm wondering if you're looking for child care, how do you access a list? That would be nice. I'll answer that for you. <laughs> um, there is a list that's updated. Um, we try monthly to update it because things always change. On the Hubbard County website, if you go to social services, there is a list of a current provider. Um, we have them printed off and ready in the lobby of Hubbard County Social Services, or you can contact me at any time and I can email you the most recent list. And if you called me yesterday, I'm sorry, I haven't called you back yet. <laughs> <laughs> Not me, but I was in a meeting with someone this morning that has kind of been stonewalled 
Okay. Um, if I could just piggyback on that, there is a DHS state license lookup. So if you want to look in the surrounding counties, um, it has all the active licenses and then any that are on pause or. And that's called licensing lookup. If you just Googled it, you'll be able to find it. Other questions? Yes. So I have a question in regard to um, you know discussion about availability. Has there been any discussion um, among providers or among county about some sort of a tracking of who has openings and who does not? Because I know that is one of the biggest concerns is having to make 30 phone calls. I mean, that takes a lot of time out of providers as well as the parents. Has there been any discussion about some sort of a system or a central location where both providers and parents can meet uh, and make that process a little quicker and easier? Um, so not current, there's not something like that currently. There is, and this was talked about, Leah, when we did our thing years and years ago. This, this is not the first child care panel I've been a part of, and it probably won't be the last. Um, there's been many, many conversations over the years. We had a big panel of a bunch of people, the Hubbard Regional Economic Development Commission, the Chamber, RDO um, team. Leah was the executive director of Mojave at the time. Um, I was involved. Um, I was the coordinator for the Early Childhood Initiative at the time. We had, um, Dana was there, I think. Um, it's not the first time it's been talked about. It probably won't be the last. And we talked about something like that then. Um, nothing ever came of it. It's a great idea, probably. Um, but nothing ever, there was never any follow through. What I will say is now, um, is that the current child care providers, or at least most of us, the ones that we know, um, a lot of our trainings are now, I'll just piggyback real quick, a lot of our trainings are now online, so we don't meet in person as much, so veteran providers like myself don't always know about or, or get to know newer, younger providers, um, which is a, kind of something I miss. I liked networking with other providers. Um, but we do have a, fa a private um, Hubbard County provider Facebook group um, that's just for licensed providers and we post in there all the time hey we're getting these phone calls does somebody have openings and we will pass on phone numbers um, some families will be like if you just tell me the names of the providers I will text or call families back if anybody has openings um, I, I actually we just um, we have a provider that's closing or did close I don't know if she did out of blue she's closing another one's going on maternity leave and another one is closing for the summer all at the same time right now oh. and so our phones have been ringing and um, we've been sharing that information with the providers there's maybe I don't know how many are in that group 20 of us maybe 25 so about half of the Hubbard County providers are in there maybe Haley's not in there I don't know if you Rock's know about it Rob's in okay <laughs> yeah so I mean we do talk with other providers we do share um, you know and and, I'll, and I will always tell families Check with Lisa, maybe she knows somebody who's in, in the process and close to being licensed to have spots to fill. Um, our providers will post in there, hey, I have a family of three moving in September, I'll have three spots, you know. Um, and so we do share, we do, we do network with other providers, um, or at least as many as we can. Um, but yeah, maybe a, you know, a good spot online where somebody could search, I guess. For, I mean, they can, the Parent Aware website has um, we have to report, so that's a whole other discussion, the Parent Aware Quality Rating Program, if anybody's any questions, but um, they do. we do have to update our profile there that talks about if we have openings or not, so um, I, think, I think that's good. Dana, can you speak to that a little bit through Child Care Aware? I know at one time. Sure, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, thanks. Um, my name is Dana, and I work with Mojave Abba Community Action and I'm the Child Care Programs Director, and I'm just really so happy that this is happening and all of you are here. Um, just a little bit about uh, your question about uh, programs that are licensed. In addition to Lisa's list at the county or the DHS licensing lookup, there's a website called parentware.org. It is a state-sponsored website, and you can go on there and do a search. You can type in your address, and you can search for family child care centers, schools, or Head Starts. And you can say how many miles around your address you'd like to find care. And it'll, it'll give you a list. So that data comes right from the state of Minnesota. 
And, and how are people made aware that it exists? <laughs> yeah, so that, so Parent Aware started, um, well first let me say, Parent Aware is a program. This website lists all programs, no matter if they have a Parent Aware rating or not. So the Parent Aware rating system is pretty new. It rolled out statewide, I want to say in 2014 or 15. So it's a fairly new, um, fairly new program that um, isn't well, well known, although Hubbard County has a high number of programs that are participating compared to the state. So kudos to Hubbard County um, providers. So it's a new, it's a new site. Um, we recognize that a lot of people don't know about it, and we are doing our best to get the word out that, that it's available. Yeah. And what Carrie was mentioning, um, just a couple years ago on that particular site, there is a way for child care programs to voluntarily enter their hours, their rates, if they have openings, what their child care philosophy might be, if they're using an assessment or a curriculum. Um, right now it's a voluntary, um, it's voluntary that people go in there and enter um, that information. We know right now because of the crisis there aren't a lot of openings, so that website isn't as effective uh, right now because there aren't any openings. But um, providers are busy. Having them do another step can be a challenge, so Carrie, thanks for <laughs> getting there and entering that information. Um, and I'm going to be back here in April, so talking more about the programs that we have to support some, some of the programs. Thanks, Haley, for mentioning us. Thank you for doing this program tonight. I appreciate all of you. I just I want to ask, and you mentioned the networking, how to network with the Hubbard County Schools with teenagers and how to help them be aware that this is uh, there is a need. What do you think about that? Actually, <laughs> interestingly enough, <laughs> I noticed that the Park Rapids schools have been posting on their Facebook page that they are doing these entrepreneur things, and I see them in the paper, and I'm like, I don't see anything about childcare in here, and I, I've seen it a couple times, and so I reached out to Lisa a month or two ago, and I just said, hey, have you been in contact with the school, have they contacted you because they're doing like these career days and these, have you seen, has, have they contacted you about childcare? And she had no idea what I was talking about. So I reached out to the school, Crystal Murphy, who's kind of doing a lot with it, and I sat at a table representing childcare at Panthers First um, two weeks ago, yeah, two weeks ago, and I will be back in April and again in May. Um, and so we did have quite a few kids come to the table and kind of see what child care is all about. But not only that, not just for them to get into child care, but for to be in their minds that they're going to need child care as well. Um, so just to get that discussion going, um, I don't think anybody knew. So as far as that goes, I have been in contact with the school. They are actually planning a class next fall um, that'll have some child care things um, touch on some child care issues there too. Um, so hopefully we'll see more and more of that. Um, but yeah, so, and Panthers First is the name of their program that I was a part of, so. And then just to mention too, to get the spark in their mind about child care, you do have to be 18 years of old, years of age to care for children in a child care setting. So it's not like we can take the BPA students uh, right. and you know, when give a provider a break, I wish we could, but you do have to be 18 years of age. And that was one of the com that was one of the questions that came up was um, because they want to do some work study and that kind of thing, and because of because of what we because of our licensing limitations, we can't have students just come in and be part of our child care. And um, we actually have to supervise them the same way we have to supervise the children that we care for. Like we literally cannot leave anybody under the age of eighteen alone with a child at all. So I couldn't hire a teenager to come in the summer and play games with the kids outside while I change a baby inside. I cannot do that legally. They have to be 18. So, another challenge, I guess. Thank you. So we've been talking about um, <coughs> private home child cares. What are the obstacles to child care centers? Why 
aren't there any child care centers here? And, and what does this community need to bring to the table to allow that to happen? Well, there is a child care center in town, for sure, it's the little red wagon. Um, Mojave also has a center-based couple different programs for them. Uh, but I believe what it takes the most is somebody being willing to find enough employees to cover care of children all the time. When they call in a sick day, then they also have to call those 10 families because their employee didn't show up to supervise those kids. They can't be over capacity. So I think it really comes down to the workforce and if somebody's willing to manage all of that. There is a difference in the licensing regulations, Correct. too. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that a little bit, Lisa? I cannot speak to center okay. ratios. I have enough with family child care to memorize those different <laughs> license brackets. Okay. Um, Beth? Leah, I just wanted to say to everyone that we did invite the Little Red Wagon <coughs> um, Child Care Center director to speak tonight, but she's very new in her position, and she just felt overwhelmed. She was doing a lot of the work herself, not just being the director, but actually working with the kids. So we I'm going to ask kids. Dana again to speak to the differences between center and family child care, because I know you're familiar yeah, with that. Yeah, sure. I, I think one of the biggest differences in the licensing is centers have to have a lead teacher in each classroom, and that lead teacher has to have um, certain credentials to be considered a lead teacher. So center lead teachers do require more training and more education. And right now, um, for a center to find a qualified candidate or invest, help them invest in getting that credential, um, it, it's very difficult. There are employers that are paying probably more than our lead teachers in some centers are being paid. So it is it is definitely, I think right now, a workforce um, issue. Um, and balancing a center to be profitable and pay those staff enough money to retain them becomes, becomes an issue. And we also know um, from some of the meetings we had in the past, First Children's Finance is a agency that does a lot of research on child care needs and they have in the past pointed out how expensive it can be to operate a center when you're paying um, all the overhead and the staff and for centers to stay profitable they have to maintain a certain number of children um, consistently enrolled and so that can be challenging to sometimes. Do you know of any family child care providers that are just infants and toddlers, or are we just infants all the way up to school age? Yeah, we don't infants have infants and toddlers are the biggest thing. You cannot find toddlers, infants or toddlers, for that matter. And I have both, so I, <laughs> I don't know. But yeah. we don't have anything like that here. They're so limited too. I mean, caring for if you are a single provider and really with any licensed class except for if you go over ten children, you're only allowed three infants or toddlers with a maximum of two infants. So yes, a provider may be able to take 10 children, but only three of them can be under the age of 12, 24 months, with limitations even of two infants. So it's really, really tough to find child care, but it's even extremely difficult to find infant or toddler care. So do you but want we to specify like I need an infant. An infant is um, from six weeks to 12 months is what's considered an infant in family child care. And then 12 months to 24 months is a toddler. And right now, Hubbard County does not have any licenses active for infant and toddler care only. Is it just not profitable? Is that why we don't have that? No. You can't have very many, I know that. Yeah, I mean, if you would have to charge, I don't know that people in Hubbard County could afford to pay what we would have to charge to only have an infant toddler license. I've actually looked at that before, um, just thinking, okay, well, if you don't have the food costs or the curriculum costs or the assessment costs or you don't have, you know, all the all the equipment that you need to buy, you still have to buy equipment. You still have to buy baby food. You still have to buy formula. You still have to buy all the things. Um, but even then, it just it it just isn't it doesn't make fine, good financial sense to do that. Um, 
the way the way things are now with how many you could take. It just it, it still limits you. You're, I mean, you can take very few. So. Mm -hmm. and how many family child care providers have substitutes that are able to come in and help? Like, is there an average search for those? I mean, how many people are willing to come in and do that? Are we not? So there's not random ones. Um, it's all their friends or their family too. Carrie's husband Eric is a huge help and her daughter. Um, so it's all about your resources that you ask to pull in and do background studies and training and what their availability is. But there's not a list right now that you can call. Their background study, they're trained, they're willing to help out here or there, call them. That's not an option right now in Hubbard County. Is the training less for a substitute as it would be for a family pet child care it is if they fly by less or not as much. I would say about ten hours, okay. not twelve, and regular providers are required at least sixteen a year. Yeah, it's I don't think it's a huge difference and that also depends on how many hours you use them too, because you know, you have substitutes for so many hours or if you go over those hours they have different they have different things. So like um, in my case, I, I am probably one of the most fortunate providers in Hubbard County because I have a husband who works shifts that allows him to be present a lot. Um, he does work outside the home, but he works 12-hour days, like two at a time. Um, and so um, I'm really fortunate that my husband will do it, and my daughter, um, my daughter is also a sub for me, and my daughter-in-law also. Um, so I have a lot of resources, um, so I'm very fortunate. and. I was just having this conversation with another provider recently. If I didn't have the flexibility that I have, I might not even be a provider anymore. Because without that flexibility, I would be closing a lot. I have medical appointments and I have, you know, I'm getting older and I have three grandchildren that I want to be able to care for and see and go to all their things. And, you know, I wouldn't be able to do that if I didn't have the subs that I have. Um, I would utilize, as, like as an example, my week vacation, um, it's a family vacation, so my subs come with me. Um, but if there was a sub that, I, that could come in and do it, I would stay open and then hire the sub. But there's not, that we don't have that available. Um, earlier I was just going to ask, from a child's point of view, like what's your schedule like for kids? And I assume you have a range of ages, so, you know, how, how does that work? You mean like a daily schedule? Like, uh, um, okay. So at, in my in my childcare, um, everybody arrives between seven thirty and eight fifteen. We have breakfast um, and then clean up. Um, and so they do free play when they arrive. Um, and just as we're greeting everybody, um, we have breakfast and clean up. Um, then we normally do. Um, in in my case, I have a, a playroom and then a main room. Um, and I have one room we do um, drawings and arts and crafts in, one room we don't. And so we kind of flit about. We do stations some days. We set up puzzles. Some days they get the manipulative. Some days it's, it's child it's child directed but providers provided. Like I give them what they can play with in a day. So we do that until lunch. Um, and then we have lunch and then we clean up. We have quiet time. And then we get up from quiet time, we have a snack, we go outside, or we do just child drive. I, everybody leaves at, from my place between three and five. So you have parents coming and going. I have preschoolers coming and going. Right now I have a big schedule with, I have a couple preschoolers who come and go. I have some part-time families that come and go. I have um, a preschooler that goes till 11 one day and another one that leaves at noon. They both have to have lunch. So it can get tricky in there. You have to be really good at managing your schedule. Um, in my case right now, Lucky for me, I've been doing it for a long time, so it's pretty easy, but it's not that easy. I, I think it's, it's, it can be pretty complicated. When I have a sub there, I have notes, and it's like from time to time. And I text families, if I think about it, if, it, if I have a family who doesn't always have the same person picking up, hey, you know, or the same time, hey, I'm gonna be gone on Thursday, who's picking up and at what time I'm making notes for Eric, or things like that, you know, it's you have to stay on top of it, but the schedule's pretty, I mean, you kind of make your schedule for whatever works for you. Um, we have time for one final question. 
Can I can I ask like three consecutive questions? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm Lucas Wakefield. I do economic development for Headwaters Regional Development Commission in Bemidji. Um, so I was glad I was able to drive down tonight and listen to you all speak. Um, I just have a couple of questions because we're hearing about the need for childcare all across the whole region. Um, I work up in Baudette and they're facing a lot of the same issues. Um, the, the question, first question that I have is, in your eyes, uh, what are the primary barriers to getting new providers to start practices? Uh, and then what uh, like additional incentives are needed or, or would be warranted to um, help alleviate those barriers? So I can start off by that, but it's costly to start a child care. It's in your home. You have Sometimes you're required to be inspected by the fire marshal. There's licensing fees. There's training fees. All that equipment that you're expected to have at a minimum. Um, the home repairs that you may have to do, it's very costly. So I would say that that's a barrier. Um, the time. If you're working to try to start a new career and all that, the time to sit down and fill out grant, paper, grant paperwork or all the different applications that you have for that. Like Healy said, the application process is long and extensive. So it's all about the time and the money, I believe, to get it started. Perfect. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, another question, uh, can multiple sort of, I mean, I guess you would call them in-home providers maybe, um, or solo practitioners, can multiple solo practitioners operate out of the same physical space without being a child care center? No. They cannot? No. There's limitations on that. Okay. And that's also set forth by the fire marshal. If you have more than a certain amount of children, then you're required to have a built-in sprinkler system. So like this, this is a beautiful space. If we had um, egress windows in here, but no, you can't have <laughs> Haley's room in there and Carrie's room in there and share a mutual space. It's not allowed in licensing. So in in Baudette, and I'm just trying to ask for my own understanding, mm -hmm. in Baudette they have uh, had the number of children in their school decline significantly, which has led them to have several empty classrooms. Mm -hmm. And they have transitioned, my understanding is, to using several of those classrooms as child care provider locations, but I don't believe they're operating as a center. So it's a special family child care is what that's considered as, which is even more extensive training and okay. doable, absolutely. Um, but more training with it, more planning, um, having an exact plan on who's using the bathroom at what time and who's using the cafeteria at this time. You can't put all 20 children together at the same time. Okay. Uh, and then just two quick ones. <laughs> Sorry. I apologize. Um, would you, and this, this may be a question for you since you spoke to this a little bit, um, is it safe to say that the economies of scale achieved by having a larger child care center are generally outweighed by the other expenses associated with having a center? Is that why there aren't very many centers and there are a lot of in-home practices? So you, don't, you just don't achieve enough economies of scale, right? Right. I think, you know, my understanding is, you know, to be profitable in a center, you need to have a variety of ages to attract um, and have full capacity. So I do really think when it does come down to being center licensed, you need to make sure you have enough families looking for care that want to enroll at a center in your community. Thank you all. Thank she you. took the mic away, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, you know, I want to speak to the uh, center in Baudet because when I was working, we did operate a center with different providers located under, um, like it was um, the home center. And that is, Lisa's is exactly right, that is really difficult to get licensed and there's a lot of training. It's a very specialized license. I can't even remember the name of it, but I'm getting too old or something. <laughs> but um, it, it is possible. It is possible. And, you know, your questions speak to the panel that we are going to be holding in, right here, April 26th. And we wanted to hear from our provider side first, the licensors first. On April 26th, we're going to hear from 
four cc um, I don't. I think two or three for sure. Okay, three for <laughs> sure. Resources that are available to support starting up a child care business, to provide grants and funding. Lisa's right on the dot. You know, it <laughs> takes a lot of money and a lot of time. And, and it's difficult. It's really difficult. So, April 26th, we'll start the other side of the discussion, and certainly we hope that you'll all um, be here that evening, too. We have a lot of refreshments in back, so please have a little cookie or a bar or something, or take it with you for your drive in the car. I would like to thank you ladies so much for being here. Um, and Cece, certainly you have stirred this initiative. Lisa, you've been really instrumental in helping select the providers to speak tonight. So thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Yes. Yeah.